Hi, Shani. Hello. How's it going? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. I thought a good way to talk about some of your techniques, we talk about kind of different instruments and your approaches to them in terms of recording and mixing, kind of mic techniques and that sort of thing. Maybe if we start with the drums, what are some of your favorite mics, mic techniques, mixing techniques? Oh, which one? Do you want mics or mixing? Uh, let's start with mics. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think I found, a, you know, I'm, I don't think I found the holy grail of any drum mics. Like drum, drums are just really hard to record, especially kicks. Um, I guess on a snare, I usually try to grab a dynamic and a condenser. Um, usually like a 57 and I'll strap it to a 451 or something like that. Um, 84 if it's, if they're handy, it's really great. Um, hi-hat mics again, I feel like it's so dependent on the player. Like once you think you've got a good mic, then the next guy comes in and you're just like, oh, okay, that sucks. Everything is terrible. Um, I guess I usually go condensers on the toms too, like a large diaphragm condenser, whatever I can find that kind of matches like an audio Technica 4050, 4033, something like that. Uh, kick, something in, something out. Again, like, please, if you've got any tips, I'll take them. Um, yeah, it's just it's just so about the player. Like, I would rather spend more time getting the drummer to tune their kit and to find the right mallets and to hit in the right spot and all that stuff. Because if you've got a good player, like, I'll just set up the mics and walk away. But, you know, if you're working with someone not so great then there's that um uh, overheads are i guess depending on what they're playing do you want the overheads to be like more of an image of the kit or do you want the overheads to be really more like symbol mics um you know i love the aea r88 either above the kit or further back in the room depending if it's like a pit of had a folk thing or like a rock and rock thing um and then like a mono mic just to have usually I like to write it up in the choruses just something kind of fun to play with but yeah that's it I'm pretty pretty simple do you usually process on the way in or leave it for mixing uh definitely process on the way in I try to get things sounding as close to mix ready as possible um unless I'm tracking for someone else which actually doesn't happen that often if i'm tracking for someone else i usually like give them more options than even i would want just because i don't know exactly what they're after um usually hopefully the producer will tell you <laughs> but you again you don't always work with a producer who has like a you know clear sight um so yeah i try to get things sounding as close to mix ready as possible are you fussy about preamps or do you generally just use kind of whatever the desk is I mean, if it's a great desk, I love to use the desk. API and Eve, Trident, like, there's something about, you know, to me, I guess, having them sort of all in the same prees gives it this blend that I that I dig. Um, if it's not a good console, then I'll go out. Uh, I'm trying to think. If I'm fussy about prees for drums. Not as fussy as I am about prees for most other things. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of other processing, do you have kind of standard go-tos that you try different EQs, compressors, that sort of thing? Um, yeah, standard mm, standard snare um, compressor. I love the TubeTech CL1B. Um, the DBX160 is also great on kick. Um, do, do, do. Love to run the toms through anything API. There's just something fun about that uh, I usually like to leave the overheads um, as as uncompressed as possible because if everything else is really tight especially if you're like doing fun compression on the rooms you need something to breathe so I try to leave that so the symbols can um, can swell and disappear as they were intended I guess uh, let me think I mean distresses are great can't go wrong uh, and then something smushy on the room, something fun, like something like a retro, you know, state level, something to play with. Um, the API 2500 is great for overheads if you are just trying to tame certain things. I do like, if we're going to tape, really compression, if it's not used artistically, like if, if you're trying to create that smushy room sound, then it's mostly just to make sure 
nothing terrible happens. You know, you don't want to ruin a take because the drummer got super excited because it was a great feeling thing, and but everything's distorting. So I do tend to, to put a compressor on almost every single thing, but most of the time it's not even touching it. What kind of overhead techniques are you normally using, mic techniques? Um, again, depending on the player, if they have like a huge spread, sometimes that can get a little dangerous to have too wide of an overhead image to me. Um, I, I love having two Omnis up there. That's really nice. Or if you're just trying to play it safe, if you put the AEA over the top, then you know you've got a good stereo image, just like... You know, it just looks really wonky because you've got to put over the, the snare and the kick, which a lot of people don't do. They'll just put it over one or the other and then one of them will be off to the side. And then as a mixer, I get very annoyed. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, honestly, drums are my least formulaic instrument, if that makes sense. There, I, I have a go-to for for almost everything, but I just think drums change so much per song, per player, per room. Per, yeah. What about uh, electric guitars? What's your go-to? Um, all right. So I usually try to put two mics on. If they're running two amps, one mic per amp, great. If they're running just one, I'll still put two mics. I love having that option to either spread it in the stereo image or use one as uh, um, more of an effect or more of a delayed put here and there. I just like having two mics. Otherwise, unless you're really intending it to be a cool, you know, Black Keys-esque, like one guitar in your ear for the whole song, I, I like to have a little bit of depth. So I'll put um, go-tos, like a BK-5B with uh, uh, with a condenser, like, you know, a U67, uh, something, something nice, like a large diaphragm condenser. So you've got those two sort of elements. And if they have a... If they have one amp that's bright and one that's dark, I'll, you know, flip, put the bright mic on the dark amp and vice versa. Just to, yeah, just colors and textures and depth for mixing. What about preamps? I mean, go-tos and neves, I, I love putting them through 1073s, 1066s, whatever, just anything full range and and warm and... I mean, if it's got the ability to get crunchy, that's great too. And I really don't tend to compress unless unless it's a um, unless it's a kind of a song where it's a solo guitar and like really you know bluesy, feely kind of thing where I will have to tame those really loud twangs. If it's a rock guitar, like the amp is doing so much compression already. If I need to, if I'm looking for something, I'll put a distressor on it, but. That's more to like have nice fine tune, um, like adjustment to, to tape, I guess. Um, as opposed to like the big Neve switches where you're like, oh, too low, oh, too over. Like, yeah, I'll use compressors more for that sense, but I don't really like to compress electric guitars. Do you generally EQ on the way in as well, or are you kind of saving that more for mixing or trying to get the right thing I to start with? Hardly ever EQ on the way in. Yeah, get the right thing to start with. Like, both the player and myself should have access to the tone. You know, and if I'm out there and if I need it brighter, you move the mic closer to the cone and vice versa. Like, I, yeah, I maybe add a little mid-range here and there, or add a little air, roll out a little, like, boomy stuff at the bottom, maybe. But I, I very rarely do that. Moving on to acoustic guitar, go-to mics, okay. techniques. Oh, go to the KM fifty fours. No, I mean, just the best. Um, <laughs> I don't have any, but let me know if you see any on the market. Uh, they're just awesome. Like uh, I, again, I like to stereo mic everything. <laughs> uh, usually, one I st I stole this technique from Gary Petrosa, who I think learned it from someone else. So that's okay. We can pass it down the line. Uh, pointing like one uh, down at the. God, I'm not a guitar player. So, like the smaller part of the guitar, point the one down down at it, and the other one come up from below. So it's sort of like two little um, two little flashlights pointing at the two wooden parts of the guitar. And I just find that that creates a really clean, non boomy, and wide stereo image. Are you mostly recording from your own studio or different studios? Totally depends. I. I have the capability to do overdubs here, which is great. But if we're doing a band, 
I'm going to go to a good studio with a really nice console and lots of good gear and hopefully a good assistant. And um, yeah, just a great open vibe if you're going for band, but it just totally depends what, what you're working with. Do you record to tape in your own studio as well, or is that more a kind of luxury of other places? Oh, sorry. When I said to tape, that's just a just a like a, okay. to the door. Right. <laughs> yeah, just, just gain to tape. I don't know. I guess I'll just pick that up. Um, no, I don't. I've I have worked with tape. I it was fine. It was extremely nerve wracking. I don't love it. I don't like. You know, I don't know it well enough to to trust that and I also tend to do a lot more like folk and Americana and bluegrass stuff so the top end is really important and I just don't really like how much tape can change that do you have any favorite studios that if the budget allows you like to go to oh um yeah definitely I mean in town I love Black Bed D um Addiction Sound Emporium um, Southern Ground, and then if they have the budget to go elsewhere, going to Asheville, Echo Mountain, is just wonderful because if you can get the whole band there, staying at the band house, there's just something so magical about that town and all of its delicious beer. Uh, moving on to vocals. Have you got favourite vocal mics, compressors? Uh, it was for... I always do a shootout, um because everyone's just so different. If I'm in a studio with a 251, definitely go on with that. Uh, that new 67 is kind of amazing. Uh, the guy that I rent the studio from bought one, and I pretty much steal it every chance I get. I was quite blown away. Uh, and before that, it was the Blue Bottle with the 251-esque capsule on it. The Sony C800, but if it's in good condition with a nice tube, that's really, really great, nice and clear. Um, yeah, and, you know, there is definitely a time and place for an SM7. Some people can make it bark and make it sound really cool, but in my opinion, <laughs> that's not everyone. So sometimes I'll put that right next to the condenser so that, again, I have something to play with texture-wise in, in mix, but um, I'll start with a large diaphragm tube condenser. Hey everyone, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by Tonalux and their brand new JC37 microphone. This is a clone of the old Sony C37A tube microphone designed with producer Joja Corelli, who was on episode 5 of the podcast. The original Sony mics were used on sessions with people like Jimi Hendrix, The Doors and The Wrecking Crew. In my opinion, these new Tonalux microphones are great for people with small studios and home studios looking to invest in one really great tube condenser mic. Unlike a lot of tube condenser microphones, these Tonal Lux mics are incredibly versatile, can be used on guitar amps, snare, kick drum, drum overheads, vocals, and almost anything that in a lot of situations a normal tube microphone couldn't handle the sound pressure of. And because you can get these microphones right up close to a lot of sources, they're great for recording in, in ideal spaces, which is what I do a lot of, as I have a portable recording studio. And another great thing about them is, even though they're hand-assembled in the USA, these mics are a lot cheaper than a lot of classic tube microphones as well. You can get a pair of them for the same price that you could get a single tube microphone from a lot of other manufacturers. Please visit tonalux.com forward slash product forward slash JC37 to see more information about them. Thanks for listening, and now back to the episode. Do you have favourite preamps for different mics? Hmm. Um, for ages I used Gary's Mastering Lab pre's, uh, but lately I've been leaning more towards towards the Neve, just that, just if you are using a mic as pristine as a C800, it's nice to have a little bit of that gushy Neve stuff. And then in the other vein, if I'm going SM7, I might go through like a Marg Pre to really like clear it up. That's got lots of gain because SM7 needs lots of gain. Um, it's got that air capability. I, I usually just try to mismatch it, if that makes sense. Um, and then love the GML EQs and compressors, especially if you're working with someone who is quite a delicate singer. That's a really nice way to capture all their stuff. That that Gmail compressor is invisible in a really great way. And then if you usually then I'll use like a dumb compressor as well. So an LA2A, a 176, tube tag, something, something warm and gushy. The 500 series, that brute limiter is 
pretty cool too. I've learned on that a few times. But yeah, that's my usual sort of go to something fast and something dumb. Have you ever got into trouble with doing too much processing on the way in that you then kind of couldn't reverse? Oh, absolutely. Especially if you're doing a hmm, like a band session where you might think that this is a scratch vocal and then they're like, oh, actually, let's just let, let's just keep that. I'm like, well, I wasn't watching the compressor. And you listen back, you're like, oh, my gosh. I mean, she, like, absolutely slamming that because I was concentrating on all these other things. Um, you know, I think earlier on I would have just maybe, you know, been too embarrassed to say anything. And then nowadays I feel like if you just speak up and you're like, hey, I wasn't aware, I want to capture a better one, can you give me one more? Hopefully they're not too lazy to do that. But, yeah, just over-compressing on the way in just makes everyone's life difficult. Everything else can kind of be reversed, I, I think. But, yeah. Moving on to bass guitar, do you have favourite mics, uh, preamps, compressors? Electric bass? No, not really. Honestly, I, I work with so many great players in town that they usually come with their own rig. They've got their DI picked out. They've got their mic picked out. Like... I very rarely even use the bass amp mic unless it's unless it's spectacular. Otherwise, it's just can get a little too messy in the mix, and there's just there's just such great processing that can be done on that end. Uh, so, yeah, um, I mean, I'm not. I have some DIs that I don't love, which I won't say. But for the most part, people come really well prepared in this town, so it's a you get a little spoiled. Bass, um, upright bass. Again, it's I love the the Sony C800. That's just got really great lows and tops, which is what you want from that instrument. And then hope, and then you can like, again, they'll usually come with their own DI that you can push in there for some mid-range. Have you noticed any different DIs, especially for electric bass that come up a lot and that you've been a fan of? I'd like to say that I did, but I don't. I don't concentrate that much. It's like, I don't know, give me a good, give me a good level. Here we go. Um, I also, again, tend to work mostly in the Americana and folk genre. So I, honestly, it's mostly upright bass that I work with. I guess as you do work in that genre, we can touch on things I wouldn't usually. So maybe like mandolin, favorite mics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, that's pretty much the same thing same processing as the acoustic guitar which would be the same for the you know like an octave mandolin anything like acoustic like that I tend to do one from the top one from the bottom it's the mandolin if she's got I say she because I was just working with Sierra if she's got two f holes I'll point them at both of those because the sound is better out of the f holes um try to get nice and close for you know Proximity effect is your friend. It's a tiny, tiny little instrument. Uh, I feel like that's the only way you're going to get like good wood sound. And, um, yeah, just a clean pair of pre's, uh, the GML EQ for air, and um, and then either a 33609 or a DBX 160 or the API 2500. I mean, it's really whatever I can get my hands on, but something quick, something with a quick release is really important. What about fiddle, which is kind of a notoriously difficult instrument to record? Yes, it is. I mean, if there's any instrument after drums that is so dependent on the player, it's the fiddle. Oh, I'm sorry. Between that upright bass. My God. Um, the fiddle. Yeah, I mean, you've really got to get in there and listen to their instrument you, because the fiddle player wants the fiddle to sound like they hear it. So how you've heard the fiddle in your head. Uh, yeah, I've been in this situation where I'm like, I'm trying to like brighten it up and I'm like, what's going on? What's the mic? And I'll go out there. I'm like, oh, it's just that dark. That's how dark your fiddle is. That's how dark you're playing. So I think it's really important to get out there and listen to the fiddle. Ask them how they like it, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, a couple of feet above the, the bridge is a good place to go. If it's a super bright fiddle, I'll put a ribbon on it, you know, something kind of something a little warmer um but if it's a nice full ranged um violin sound then again the 54 is great um the 67 you can go small or large di diaphragm condenser in my opinion and yeah i think it's just so dependent on the player and then a nice warm gushy compressor <laughs> what about banjo which um, another thing in my experience is kind of difficult to record um, it is 
It isn't, it isn't, because it's such a, um, if you've got a good player, it, it, I don't know how to explain it. It's such a consistent instrument. So they rarely surprise you. You know, it's not too much like, hopefully not too much taming of the dynamics that you have to do. This again, if you have a good player. Um, and it's just such a loud instrument. <laughs> so you're pretty much good to go. I just like any large diaphragm condenser. So a blue, a 67, a 251, 269, um, something nice. And sort of on the like the bottom part of the drum. So below their right hand is where I'll aim it. Maybe a foot away, just you know. Again, banjo players, they don't they don't move their hands around, so you can get as close as you need to, and they're not gonna bang the mic. So if it is sounding really thin, you can get really close and, and take advantage of proximity. Or if it's just like raging, metallic and like ugly, you can get a little further away. Are there any instruments that you record a lot of that I haven't touched on? Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess dobro, I pretend is just the banjo held the other way. It's the same thing. Like, uh, like if you're below their right hand or they got it on their lap, um, something large, something warm, depending on how metallic it really is. Um, I get pretty close, like closer than you would think. And that's, yeah, you'll find that often it's the same player in the room. So that's handy that you can like go with the same mic. And then I'll keep a ribbon handy, especially if they do want a spread as well and if they want something warm. So, yeah, something really clear and then something warm is just a good good thing to go with. What other weird things do I record <laughs> in my little world? Uh... Do you record a lot of lap steel or pedal steel? Yeah. Um, yes, and again, those guys usually come really well prepared. They usually come with their own amp. They know where to point the mic. For, for the most part, pedal steel for me uh, is an overdub situation. So I record it the same way I would record electric guitar. I think the last thing we haven't touched on is piano. Do you have any favorite techniques, mics, upright or grand? Changes a lot. Um, I'll, for me, it changes a lot for the song. So I'll ask them to play in the key as close to what they think they're going to play on the song as possible because if they're playing all down low, I don't need the full spectrum up top. So I'll try to follow their, their movements. If I'm going something pop, I'll try to really capture the hammers. If I need something warm, I'll definitely make sure to get one more in the middle of the piano near the sound hole so that it really resonates like that. I stick my whole head in the piano and you see where it's speaking to you because the piano is such of its own beast and I'm a piano player by trade. So it, it, you know, every room that you go in makes the piano sound different. Every, every song, every, like how much he's using the sustain pedal, how noisy he is with the sustain pedal. And so I think that's one of those things that I've never quite, I won't stick to just one thing, but I'll, I will usually start with two large diaphragms spaced and then wiggle them as needed. Sorry, that was the dog. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about how you came to mix the Mountain Goats album recently? Oh, um, <laughs> that was a complete surprise. I, I tried to figure out, for, I mean, the managers just reached out to me. I tried to figure out like, who put me in touch with them. Like, who do I have to thank for this? And I kept asking, you know, all my, all my usual people who usually put me up for gigs. And they were like, no, first of all, like, who's the Mountain Goats? I'm like, okay, my generation, I think. Um, and when I finally met um, John Daniel, he he said he found me. He'd been following my career, which is extremely flattering. Um, and he just wanted me to do it. And I think his producer was just like, who? <laughs> um, but it was amazing. It was such a cool experience and, and different from what I usually do. But because they are, they do rely on acoustic instruments. I felt like I was able to bring those skills to it. And when someone like Matt Ross bang tracks it, you're just good to go. Like you get it, you put the faders up and you're like, well, I guess I can like make this a little better, <laughs> but it's, it's so good already. Yeah. I was going to ask, what was it like mixing something tracked by Matt? Cause he's, he's oh such a God. great engineer. It's just, I love when a producer and an engineer and a band, they know exactly what they're going for. That, that me as a mixer, cause I don't, um, I mix in Cubase, so I don't keep any like Pro Tools levels or plugins. Even though people hand them to me, I'm like, well, I'm not keeping it. I don't want to either. Um, but when you work with people 
with that much foresight to what they're after, you can pretty much put the faders at zero and you completely understand what they were going for. And then the, and then you can just be creative. Like I don't have to spend, you know, 75% of the time fixing things, which is a lot of the time what I get is just me fixing your sounds before I can even be creative. But when you work with a team like that, it's like, oh, cool. I can just, I'm just playing at this point. Was it mixed in your own studio? Uh, yes. Actually, that time I had just gone to New York on a whim. I just wanted out of Nashville for a hot second. So I like, moved there four months last year and built a studio in my brownstone apartment. <laughs> just drove it all up from Nashville, built it, um, and that's where I mixed that record. So <laughs> it was scary, but I think it turned out okay. Were you using a lot of outboard gear as well? Uh, no, I'm a hybrid hybrid gal. I just think, I mean, I started that way for cost purposes, and I, but I think I would stay that way forever. It, it, it just, in this day and age, with how many recalls people want you to do, how quickly they want to tweak this, tweak that, I mean, and I'm a tweaker too. So it, it's just impossible to have that much outboard gear that's never going to come back exactly how you left it anyway. So I mix in Cubase, and then I have a two-bus chain, which changes but at the moment it's the api 2500 going through the marg um eq4m you mentioned kind of having to fix things are there general differences between mixing stuff that you've recorded and stuff you've been sent to mix the differences yeah uh hmm actually i'm not sure i'm not sure i think i think i do a better job with other people's tracks because I can approach them with fresh ear and and I I, you know yeah (laughs) there's something something different about that and I'm really focusing on the groove and the players whereas like if I mix something that I've already you know produced engineered and it comes and we've like been comping vocals it's hard for me to get a fresh ear on it I have to actually make an effort to step away maybe pull down all the faders, even though we've been tracking and we had it in a good spot, just start completely again. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> do you normally deliberately leave anything for mastering? Do I leave anything for mastering? What do you yeah. mean? Well, I know some mixers might kind of ease off on the compression things in case the master might want to, to kind of do the final compression. Oh, yeah, it. yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, yeah, my mixes are pretty hot, but they're not slammed. But I will um, usually do some combination of easing up on my send to the two bus. And then I usually have, I have a digital limiter after the two bus, so it doesn't, so there's no overs, um, which I've been loving the Pro L2. So, and I know that mastering engineers will sometimes use that actual plugin. So I'll just go ahead and deactivate that usually, and then just decrease the feed to the two bus so that... It's the same kind of color and it's the same reaction, but just a little less aggressive. And I give them both. And then always, you know, you try to find a mastering engine that you can communicate with. It's like, I don't want you having to bend over backwards trying to fix my stuff. If you're needing something, let me know. And I can tweak it and send it back, you know, within the day. So that's a good reason to have a a relationship with your mastering engineer. How do you normally decide whether to kind of compress on the way in or leave it for mixing or leave it for the two bus at the end? Um, <laughs> I think it all varies. I try to, again, like when I'm tracking, I try to get everything sounding like I would want it to sound in mix. Um, if I am just tracking for someone who I don't know, I will leave a little bit of room. I won't make such aggressive decisions. Um, But if it's for me, I pretty much know what I want. And then the mixing is just, um, just for nothing. It's just a little, it's minutia. It's for me, it's more about automating and reverbs and delays. That's, that's what I'm more concerned with come mixing. And then always, you know, I'll put a little bit more compression on things just to make sure it doesn't get lost in the mix, in the radio, on the car, just you having to bring up the low stuff. What are some of your favorite reverbs? Ooh, uh, I love, I mean, go-to is the EMT 140, but I love the Valhalla stuff. Um, I was into the vintage one for a while, but for me, I love the room. It just does, 
everything I needed to do. I always want a long, dark verb, and you can just do anything with that bloody plugin. I just love it. And the Valhalla Shimmer, I love for like strings or anything that you want shimmery. Ah, uh, what other verbs do I use? Honestly, I'll start there. If I need, if I want something a little like springier, I'll reach for the 250 or the little plate. But my go to would be to have like a couple of those rooms rocking a 140 and then the vintage if needed. What about delays? Echo Boy all the way. It's just so good. You can do whatever you want. Again, I've got like a, I've got an effects, I get my effects as set up as possible before the mix starts so that I don't, um, so that I have it all at my at my grasp. And obviously I'll go in and finesse things and I'll try different settings. But in general, I'll go in, I've got an eighth note, a quarter note set up, a slap set up, um, mono left and mono right, which I use the Steinberg one. Um, and then I've got a couple of Echo Boy sort of presets that I've created over the years that I have just sitting around just in case. But yeah, man, I can't go past that blog and it just does everything I need to do. Just to finish up, could you talk a little bit about your career path and kind of how it's led you to where you are now? Ooh, um, mixture of, mixture of luck and hard work. God, it sounds so awful. But I mean, there is this such a right place, right time um, element of this industry. You know, like you can work as hard as you want, but you just need someone to give you a chance. And for some lucky reason, I managed to find a couple of producers in town who believed in me and gave me a chance and all of those guys actually um were really invested in helping me grow as opposed to like keeping me and as assistant so that was really lucky as well because not everyone's like that so I you know came out of school and I interned and worked at one studio for a while but then after that I just ended up assisting like five different producers uh, Marshall Altman, Craig Alvin, Neil Capolino, uh, Gary Petrosa and then just sort of learnt different things from all of them, which was amazing, and ended up mostly working with Gary for the next five years. And I've now I rent a studio for Marshall. And so it's all one big Nashville happy family. And it just got me where I needed to go to go off on my own, but still have those incredible engineer and producers who I can just call up at a moment's notice and be like, hey, how do you do this? Like, what are your tricks for this? And they're like, oh, let me tell you. Would you like to lend this? Would you like to borrow this? Like, blah, blah, blah. blah. It's like, Nashville's wonderful that way. I think that's all my questions. So thank you so much for speaking with me. No worries.